No Limits Church is a place where you come in to get equipped to go out and make a difference for the kingdom of God. And we're currently in a series about end-time promises. Won't be long before Jesus comes back. Can I get an amen? Anybody ready? <clears throat> but in order to accomplish everything he has for us in these last days, we must learn how to live in his promises. We won't do it otherwise. This series is not just teaching about God's promises. It's a manifestation of God's promises. The time is now for these promises to manifest. We've already heard some great testimonies, and there are more to come. Now, last week, I helped you build your confidence in God's promise of protection. So I have to know, is there anybody in the room who you maybe came in a little bit afraid last week, and you conquered those fears because of what you heard last week, and now you're living in freedom? Anybody? Awesome. We've got a few in the room. That's awesome. Now, the, the only way to be bold enough to accomplish what God has for you is to have a revelation of his protection. Because you can't, and you can't just know about it. Like, it has to be something that... You, that you know like deep down inside of you that you can't be shaken away from it. And when you have this confidence, fear no longer controls you. And man, that's a good place to be. Sickness no longer scares you. Death is no longer a big deal. You live with confidence knowing that you get to decide when it's time to go because God has given you the authority to decide when it's time to lay down your life. And he's promised that he's going to protect you from all harm and he's even going to protect you from deadly disease. And that includes COVID. So there you go. But I don't want you to forget this promise has a condition, just like all the other promises we've talked about. Take a look in Psalms 91. If you make the Lord your refuge, if you make the most high your shelter, no evil will conquer you, no plague will come near your home. If you want to live in God's promise of protection, you have to make him your refuge. What does that mean? That means you look to nobody else, you look to nothing else for protection other than Almighty God, and you put your complete trust in Him. You don't need to fear sickness. You don't even need to fear threats from the woke mob. You don't got to fear that stuff. You don't even need to fear Satan and his demons. All right? Be confident in God's promise of protection and live with boldness as you accomplish everything God has for you to do. Now, a few weeks ago, we talked about the end-time wealth transfer And since then, I've received several testimonies about financial miracles. It's been awesome. Interestingly, the testimonies have come not only from people who were here in the room with us that day, but even those who are watching this message online. One testimony was from a family who didn't have enough to meet their bills, and normally they would have stressed over... Do I need to switch my mic or something? Hold it right? All right. They're they're instructing me back there. All right. So one testimony from a family. They didn't have enough to meet their bills. Normally, they would have stressed over the budget, sat down at the kitchen table, and like worked the numbers... Anybody done that before? Been there, done that, right? But this time they decided, you know what? We're going to put all this aside. We're going to trust God and see how he handles this. And within just a few days, they received an unexpected discount on one of their bills. And they also had somebody pay them for something that they had done for free. And these two things combined equal the exact amount that they needed to meet their budget. (laughs) Yeah, really cool. God is good. Now, another testimony was from a family who had a random guy come knock on their door. If this happened at my house, we would probably just ignore it. (laughs) Anybody else like that? Like, I didn't hear anything. You didn't hear anything. But after this story, uh, you might actually start answering those random visitors. So reluctantly, they answered the door, and here's what the guy said. He said, this might sound crazy, but my dad used to live in this house years ago. I believe he buried something in the backyard. I'll give you $5,000 if you'll allow me 30 days to come dig in the backyard and try to find it. So how would you respond to something like this? They, <laughs> they told me their first thought was, uh, it's not a dead body, is it? Uh, you know, it, It's not your dad, is it, right? <laughs> Turns out he, they were looking for buried silver bars. So they dug up the backyard. They never found them, but nevertheless, they got paid $5,000 just to let somebody dig around in their backyard. Amazing. When it comes to this wealth transfer, God's going to perform it in many unexpected ways. Speaking of, Tim, I was wondering if you would come share your car story with us. Another unexpected way that God works these things out is quite incredible. You guys are going to love this. Let's give Tim a hand as he comes up. He normally warns me about these things, but he didn't today. Well, uh, uh, many of you uh, remember how uh, about three years ago, I I had the opportunity to buy a really rare car, and uh, it was a lot of money, and the whole time, the Holy Spirit's telling me, go ahead and, you know, get it. I'm like, really? That's bizarre. Why would I do that? This is a crazy car. It's not sensible, even a little. (laughs) 
And so, uh, so those of you that are car guys, it was an S209. It was a, it's only one of 209 in the whole world. Uh, and for three years, I had the fun of driving this car around very fast. I even took it out to Hallett. If, uh, if any of y'all are car guys and like to go to Hallett, that's, that's good, clean fun right there. So uh, I took that and did all these things. And uh, Darla, uh, my wife, is about to open her own uh, clinic here in, in Owasso, and, and it's looking like January. And so I told the Holy Spirit, I said, you know, we, we could use a little, a little money for this, uh, for this endeavor that we have going on here. And, and I felt a real peace about it. And I felt my heart begin to change over this car, this S209. And I was no longer very attached to it. I was, and he was preparing me to sell it. So just for fun, I got on. I said, I wonder what it's worth. So I slapped it on there to a car guru just for fun. And, uh, at about seven o'clock in the morning and about three o'clock that afternoon, the guy says, I'll give you this amount of money. And I was like, holy cannoli, way above what I expected to get. So, uh, I said, sure. And so the next day, <clears throat> he paid for it in cash. I was like, holy cow. But then now the next problem I had then is I had no car to drive. Uh, so I was like, well, you know, Darla is way too busy to be driving me places. So, uh, uh, so I was like, uh, man, what am I going to do? And so the Holy Spirit says, well, look in and see what kind of car you want. So I had a, a car in mind, a very reasonable car. And I I found one up in Kansas, of all places. So we started looking around. Darla Darla loves to research stuff. So we found cars all through Kansas. We're like, why don't we just take a little weekend drive up into Kansas? We'll stay at a cute little hotel. We'll have a good time. So we did. So we drove up into Kansas, and the first car that I found was exactly what I thought I wanted. And the Holy Spirit said to me, he says, "You you can take this. Or... You can wait and get my plan. And I was like, you know what? I think I'm going to go with your plan. So, uh, so we continued. We, got, we went up into Kansas, and uh, I, I, we were at this one place that, man, the spirit, I could tell there were crooks. You ever do that? Walk into something, and you're like, ooh, I don't have a piece here at all. So, but, at, but I'm like, you know, this doesn't keep me from driving stuff. So, because again, I don't even know where he's leading me with, I mean, I just wanted another Subaru, just a little Forester, you know, a two thousand. I wanted just a little 2005 Forester, nothing fancy, right? So he takes me up there and he goes, try out that Mercedes. I'm like, what? What are you even talking about? And I'm like, all right. So I drove it and I'm like, you know, that's pretty sweet. <laughs> you know, after driving a track car around, I don't know, very stiff suspension, very low to the ground, very with Recaro racing seats, you know, that, and you just, and Darla didn't even like to drive it. She didn't want any part of it. So uh, we went, to, so I started looking at Mercedes for crazy reasons. So we, we, we didn't buy anything at the crook shop, obviously. So we went to the next one, uh, or no, uh, we went to bed. We decided, well, let's just sleep on this. So we went to the hotel and had a really good Thai meal. I don't know if y'all like spicy, spicy Thai. I do. So we, we went to bed. The next morning, Darla, of course, is doing her general, you know, search around thing. And she goes, you know what? I think after we went to one other lot there, but it wasn't even open. So we're, I think I may have found what we're, oh, no, it wasn't yet. So she goes, I think we ought to just go home. So we're, let's, and the Holy Spirit was leading, let's go home. So we went home. I took a nap because I'm, I like naps. So uh, right after our nap, uh, she starts looking at this, and she goes, you know, I think I may have found exactly what we're looking for, just 15 miles away. So we went down, and sure enough, there was a Mercedes that had just come in. Uh, it, was, it was older, so it wasn't that expensive. And as it turns out, just the money from... What I paid for my S209, the difference between what I paid for the, and what he gave me, I paid for the Mercedes that God led me to in cash. <laughs> so I went from a 2005 Forester to a really sweet Mercedes that I've already put a sub in. <laughs> That's awesome. You know what I love most about that story is how the Holy Spirit ask you to do crazy, crazy things. You're like, buy this car 
for that much money. And then he, he got to enjoy it for three years for free is how it turns out. And then it ended up paying for his next car. I mean, only God can pull something like that off, right? Only God. All right. So today I'm going to build upon my message of the end time wealth transfer. So we'll just call this part two. I was a little bit concerned when the Lord led me to speak on this subject again, because if you preach about money more than once in a year, you get deemed one of the prosperity preachers. Honestly, though, I'd rather be known as a prosperity preacher than a poverty preacher. So let's lay that out there. <clears throat> but because the, the truth is God's desire is for his people to be wealthy so they are fully equipped for every good work. That's his desire. So the prosperity message, though, it does get out of balance whenever it's the only thing you talk about. and We've all seen that, right? But that goes for any subject in the Bible. If all you talk about is one subject, you're going to be pretty out of balance because we need a variety of spiritual food to be healthy. But sometimes we need a higher dose of a specific subject for the season that's at hand because if we aren't ready for the end-time wealth transfer, y'all, we're going to miss it. We can't miss it, though, because God needs these resources in our hands so that we can accomplish his will on the earth in these last days. I don't know if you realize this, but everything we do here costs money. So we got to have it. Let me remind you of the tongue and interpretation we received a few weeks ago. My disciples were in the last hour. You are in the last seconds. Do not be afraid. Be bold and go out. The harvest is near. Call all that you can to God. And then this was followed by a prophetic word. You are mine, says the Lord. Nobody takes anything from me. I have you in my hands. Nothing can come against you. I own you. You are mine. You belong to me. Should have shared that again last week, right? I mean, that goes right in line. He was letting you know, I'm protecting you. I'm watching over you. Don't worry about it. And then the move of the Holy Spirit, that move of the Holy Spirit ended with a vision that he gave me of a gold dust storm rushing towards us. And here was the interpretation of that vision. There's a great provision for my people. I need you to receive it and not reject it. You are the ones I can trust with it because your hearts are pure and your motives are right. You will know exactly what you need to do with it. All of this happened a month ago. Y'all remember? It was Sunday, August 7th. And ever since then, I've been checking myself to make sure that I'm positioned and ready to receive this end-time wealth transfer. And you may be thinking, well, who wouldn't receive a wealth transfer? Well, there's many reasons why we wouldn't receive a wealth transfer. Some are going to be tempted to reject it because it's something you didn't work for. We're going to be harvesting things that we didn't plant. That's an interesting concept, right? And some of you are going to have a hard time with that because it's a challenge because you want to earn your wealth. Others are going to be tempted to reject it because it sounds too good to be true. And you would rather hold on to your skepticism than receive something from God. And then there will be some who are tempted to reject it because you don't need it. You've been living in God's blessing of abundance for quite some time, and you've settled in the area of abundance that you live in. I'm a little embarrassed to say that I've been working through all three of these things over the last four weeks, but I'm making progress, and I hope you are too. But today I want to deal specifically with that third issue. I believe most of us need to expand our capacity to receive. You see, it's easy to settle into the level of wealth that we live in. We get all our needs taken care of. We have maybe a little extra to have fun. Maybe we, maybe we even have some solid investments going on. If this, apply, this applies to more people than you think. You don't have to be a six-figure earner to fit into this category. This is everyone who has what it takes to maintain the lifestyle that they have chosen. I've been in this category most of my adult life. Even when Beth and I made $30,000 a year combined, right? Both of our salaries together, we made $30,000 a year. And all the way to today where my business gives me a six-figure income. At every income level, I've settled. I've settled. We had food and shelter. We were always given 10% tithes to our church. We were good. But over and over, the Lord has rebuked me for settling and helped me move on to the next level. Let's keep going. Although he sure has blessed me along the way, the next level wasn't just for me. It was for others as well. And it's, for example, if I would have settled as a solopreneur when I was working by myself and generating a nice income working by myself, then my business wouldn't be providing for my employees. Now, you understand? And not only that, but as my income grows, my generosity grows because I give a percentage, right? And now I give far beyond that because I have all this extra income. What am I going to do with it? I'm going to be generous with it. 
Generosity is great. It really is the joy of abundance. But I don't want you to get the idea that God does not want to bless you along the way. Because so many people have a hard time with this. They get upset when somebody in a different category of wealth buys a new house or a car or whatever it is. And you think things like, they should have given that money to the poor. This might hurt a little, but if you've had thoughts like that, you're the one with the problem. The root of these types of comments is jealousy. You want their wealth because you think you could do a better job with it. Let me release you right here. When we get to heaven, God's not going to hold you accountable for how somebody else spent their money. So you might as well let it go. You don't have to worry about it one bit. Let me show you something else that's going to bring you freedom. In Proverbs chapter 10, verse 16, the earnings of the godly enhance their lives, but evil people squander their money on sin. If you're enhancing your life with your wealth, you're in good company with the godly. How cool. God is pleased with you when you love your family and care for your family with your wealth. Oh, this is hard for you to take, isn't it? Yes, be generous. Yes, enhance your life. It's not one or the other. It's both. Trust me, God has more than enough to cover both of those things. So my question to you today is, have you settled? Have you settled? Because I found out a few weeks ago that once again, I had settled. I was completely unaware of it, by the way, until the Lord started dealing with me on some things. And maybe he's doing the same for you today. I hope that he is. A little over five years ago, I stumbled over this house on Zillow that was like a dream come true. But it was just outside of my capacity to receive. (laughs) So I went by myself to drive by. I didn't tell anybody about this. I didn't want Beth to know that I was dreaming outside of our comfort zone, you know. So when I got there, though, something connected in my spirit. I knew it was for us. I was like, this is my home. This is where we're supposed to live. So I took the risk, and I told Beth about it. And we went to look at it. And Beth had her list of desires. I had mine. All the married couples in the room know. And normally you have to compromise, right? This house met all of them, down to the last detail. It was mind-blowing. I wanted a house in the trees that had gigabit internet. Good luck, right? That ain't going to happen. Well, this house had both because the house is in a neighborhood, but it's on a green belt that's full of these dense, beautiful, mature trees. Only one problem, the price, I thought the price was too much. It's just too much. We could do it, but it was irresponsible. Probably what you thought whenever you bought that car, Tim. I can do this, but it's irresponsible. So after much stressing about the numbers, we went ahead and we put in an offer because I couldn't, I couldn't shake that God was leading me like, this is where you're supposed to live. We've now been living there for five years. And the house payment has never been a problem. We actually just doubled our house payment so that we could pay it off faster. And we've been doing that for a year now, probably. Looking back, I can see now that God used the house to expand my capacity to receive. If I had settled where we were comfortable, instead of following where God was leading me, I wouldn't be where I am today because I'd still be. Mr. Comfortable over here. For a little over a year now, Beth and I have been looking for a house on some land. Our desires have changed over the years, and uh, neighborhood life is no longer where we want to be. Nothing wrong with it. It's just not where we want to be. Our desire now is to raise horses and chickens and cattle. We want to be a part of solving the food problems of today, and we want our kids to learn the value of working on a farm. And I'll just be up front with this. Neither Beth nor I have ever worked on a farm, so we are going to learn the value of working on a farm. (laughs) And everybody who's worked on a farm laughs at us. I get it. It's going to be funny to watch, I'm sure. So I don't know how many properties we've looked at. We we went to Ramona. We went to Oshaleta. We went to Talala. We went to Ulaga. Lots of great properties, but every time I'd get out there, I'm like, man, this is just a little bit too far from church life. It's always like a 30-minute drive or more. It's like, I don't know that I want to be that far away. So every week for over a year now, we've been watching what shows up on MLS and then torturing my mom, who's our realtor, uh, to go take us and see the ones that pique our interest. So finally, we we find this house that's only a mile from where we live right now, and it's on 17 acres. It's cross-fenced, and it has a pond and a garden. It's fully ready to start raising animals, and it even has a pool. Only one problem. It's a three-bedroom, two-and-a-half bath. We have five kids. And we were hoping for something a little bit bigger than where we live now, and this is smaller. 
But we went to look at it anyways. And I already knew the land was gorgeous because I'd driven by it many times. It, this is on a road where I drive my convertible a lot. It's just a back country road. And actually, just a few weeks before it went on the market, I was driving down that road and I said out loud, I said, Lord, I would love to live on this road. It's just beautiful out here and it's so close to church. But like anybody here is going to sell. I remember saying that a few weeks before it was listed. So the land, check, exactly what we want. The house, well, we'll give it a chance. Like, let's go, let's go see it. And as soon as I walked in, had that same connection in my spirit, I knew this, this is home. I don't know how this three-bedroom thing's going to work, but we'll figure it out. So I went home and I ran the numbers. Land is not cheap whenever you're only a few miles from town. I found the number that would work for us, and it was $100,000 less than what they were asking for it. So I tortured my mom again, and I asked her to submit this crazy offer. We included a letter with our offer that explained why we were offering so much less. And the main reason was so that we could add on to the house later to accommodate our big family. And surprisingly, they agreed to our offer. I know. It's awesome. So we closed on the house this past Wednesday. (laughs) And we'll move in in three weeks. So far, so good. Y'all, I really didn't have to expand my capacity to receive much on this one because the purchase price landed exactly where I wanted it to be. And we have a lot of equity in our current home, so everything was good. And then a few days after listing our current home for sale, I heard the Spirit of God say, keep both houses. I knew, I know it was the Lord's voice. I mean, it was definitely his because I know what it sounds like. But my reasoning took over in an instant. I was like, that's ridiculous. I mean, why would I keep both? That would be a bad steward. I mean, what's this house going to do? Is it just going to sit here with no purpose? Because we live in one of those HOAs. You can't rent it. You can't Airbnb it. You can't do any of that stuff. So why keep, this is ridiculous. And on and on I went until I convinced myself to dismiss what the Lord had said to me and just move on. Our current home is in a very desirable location. It's a great house. Everybody, we told our neighbors we were moving, and everybody's like, oh, you're going to have an offer in like a day or two. I mean, this is going to be gone before you know it. Ten days later, we had like a handful of showings and no offers. And at this point, I started getting a little bit nervous. So I started researching like all the other houses that were for sale. I'm like, what's wrong? Is the price wrong? Like, what's going on here? I checked our MLS listing. I was like, hey, mom, did you do everything right on that MLS listing? I mean, something's got to be wrong here. I asked Beth, I was like, should we lower the the price, babe? I mean, what do we need to do? And after an hour or two of reasoning and researching about uh, our house not selling yet, Beth was moved by the Holy Spirit. And here's what she said. I'm making this move easy for you. Stop making it difficult. We're like, okay. To be honest, the lack of showings kind of hurt my feelings. But it was actually kind of nice. I mean, can you imagine getting a house ready to show with five small kids? It's been quite exciting around my house. Small kids, uh, they don't really like to clean. I don't know if you knew that or not, but, and they can make a mess in a quick second, man. Like before you even get out the door, right? The house was clean and five minutes later, it's back to where it was. So now we're not in a hurry to move. We can take some time to get the new house ready before we move into it. But my need for efficiency just doesn't like it. I, like, had planned and imagined closing on both houses on the same day, getting the move done, still having plenty of cash in hand to keep me comfortable. But the Lord was saying, quit being in a hurry. Relax. Take this at my pace. Do it my way, even when it doesn't make sense to your feeble mind. Thanks, Lord. Thank you. So I submitted at the moment to his rebuke. (laughs) But in the days following, I was kind of like a yo-yo. One moment I was like, let's do what the Lord said and keep both houses. And then two minutes later, I'm like, we got to get this house sold right now. (laughs) So when our house had been listed for two weeks, still with no offers, zero, not one, I asked Beth, you know, what if we just keep this house for an office space for me and my team? We would have gigabit internet. We would only be a mile from where we live. I mean, that'd be awesome. And both of our eyes lit up. We'd found the purpose for keeping both houses. We're like, oh, there is purpose here. So I spent the rest of the day reasoning it out, pros and cons and running the numbers. And even after all that, I knew it would work. 
Yet I continued to yo-yo for days. Anybody ever yo-yo with the Lord, right? Back and forth, back and forth. So let me read to you what I wrote in my journal uh, a week ago today. With this house situation, what it comes down to is this. I'm rebuking myself in my own journal. God is leading me to keep both. The door is open, and I'm going to walk through it. Sure, I could find reasons not to, but God knows the future. His leading holds infinitely more wisdom than my reasoning. I'm going to trust him to do what he's leading me to do. Keep both. No more reasoning and listing pros and cons. Trust and rest. So at this point, I mostly gave up the fight. Mostly. I was still tempted to reason it out, but I did a pretty good job of letting it go. So now that my fretting was over, the Lord finally had an opportunity to teach me. He's always waiting for us to get quiet, right? So he can teach us something. So in my morning quiet time this past Tuesday, I was led to read Ephesians 3. And I've read this chapter more times than I can count because it's our core scripture here is Ephesians 3, 16. All glory to God who's able through his mighty power at work within us to accomplish infinitely more than we could ask or think. But I knew the Lord was going to show me something that I had never seen as many times as I'd read it. So I went and I read it. And Ephesians 3 is where we find out that God's resources are glorious and unlimited. Verse 8 tells us that there are endless treasures available to us in Christ. Amazing. And I've always interpreted this to mean spiritual treasures, like joy and peace and things like that. But when I looked up the original Greek word, you find out that it means abundance of external possessions. So when it talks about the endless treasures available to us in Christ, it's talking about everything inward and everything outward. It's talking about everything. The question is, how do we access this abundance? That's what the Lord revealed to me whenever I read Ephesians 3 this time. Take a look at verse 19. May you experience the love of Christ, though it's too great to understand fully, because then you will be made complete with all the fullness of life and power that comes from God. And the word experience jumped out at me. In order to access the endless treasures available to us in Christ, we must first submit to the experience of the love of Christ. So often we reject the experience that Jesus tries to give us of his love. For example, the Lord is trying to give me an experience of his love by making a way for me to keep both houses. And I worked hard to reject the experience through, my, through all these reasons, right? But if I reject it, I delay my ability to walk in the fullness of life and power that comes from God because that only comes through experience. And I also miss my opportunity to prepare myself for the wealth transfer. Endless wealth is fully available to us in Christ. We need to learn how to access it. And it's as simple as submitting to each experience of the love of Christ, no matter how crazy it seems to your mind. The Lord wants to do things in your life that you can't comprehend. He does. But if you try to reason, your, if you try to reason it out, though, you'll talk yourself out of it every single time. Tim, did you almost reason your way out of that car? Okay. I love that you have that story to share because it's perfect timing because you can see how the story ends, right? I'm still in the beginning of my story, not quite sure how this whole house situation is going to end up, but it's going to be awesome, just like Tim's story ended up. And Tim, you got another one coming, so get ready to submit to that experience. So you have a decision to make today. Are you going to settle where you're at, where you're comfortable, where you can understand Or are you going to submit to each experience of the love of Christ and let him accomplish infinitely more than you could ask or think? What are you going to do? I'm choosing to dive into each experience of his love, and I hope you'll join me. So after the Apostle Paul talks about this unlimited abundance of God in Ephesians, he issues a warning about money shortly thereafter. Take a look. He says, you can be sure that no immoral impure, or greedy person will inherit the kingdom of Christ and of God. For a greedy person is an idolater, worshiping the things of this world. So you'll often hear this phrase that sin is sin. Anybody ever heard that one? Sin is sin, like it's all equal. And this started out pure because they're simply making the point that Jesus forgives all sin, and he does. I mean, that's 100% true. But nowhere in Scripture, not in the Old Testament, not in the New Testament, will you find this phrase, sin is sin. It's not true. 
because there are certain sins that will lead you back into darkness faster than anything else. Sexual immorality, sexual immorality is one. Greed is another. If you're greedy, you're proving Jesus is not your Lord. Money is. You're worshiping things. You are not worshiping God. Greed is sneaky too. I mean, it's sneaky. It shows up to tempt you and you don't even realize what's going on, but you're going to realize it after this because I'm going to help you identify when greed is trying to show up. First of all, greed is not an amount of money. It's a motive. You can be rich and greedy. You can be poor and greedy. Greed has two primary qualities. You want what other people have. You want to accumulate as much as you can. If you find yourself thinking, why does the Lord want Cade to have two houses? I don't even have one. When's the Lord going to do something for me? That's greed, trying to overtake your life. If you go to work and you think, they don't deserve that job, I would do it way better. I don't understand why they got promoted and I didn't. That's greed, trying to overtake your life. If the Lord leads you to do something that drains your savings account, but you struggle giving up that accumulated wealth, that's greed, trying to overtake your life. Greed shows up in one of two ways. Either you want what somebody else has, or you want to accumulate things and never let them go. Reject greed. Reject it. When you have thoughts like these, reject them. Don't entertain them for one second. Just tell Satan to shut up, because greed will lead you to a dark place every time. And here's a pro tip. One of the best ways to overcome greed is to find some way to be generous. Every time you have a greedy thought, show it who's boss by leaving an outrageous tip for your waiter. Or give away one of your favorite things to a friend. Or give an extra offering here at church. Whatever it is, just find some way to be generous because it'll kill greed every time. So everything I talked about today can actually be summed up in something that the Lord spoke to me this past Wednesday. And here's how I wrote it down. He said, expand your capacity to receive. Stop limiting me with small thinking. Submit to the fact that you can't comprehend the amount of wealth available to you in Christ. You might as well take the cap off because I'm not capping it. It's a free flow, a rushing river, an endless supply. Don't try to store it up. Don't stop the flow by hanging on to it. Let it flow freely because there is always more to come. Woo! Amen. You see how he coached me on greed in that last section? Don't store it up. Don't stop the flow. Greed is what makes you do those things. Just let it keep flowing. I love this, I love this part. It's a, it's a free flow, a rushing river, an endless supply. Amazing. Amazing. Expand your capacity to receive. That's what the Lord is asking us to do today. Expand it. Praise the Lord. Lord, we thank you for this word today. We thank you that you're getting us positioned and ready for what you're going to do. Wow. I ask that you continue to correct us, renew our minds. We want to be ready. We want to be ready. Lord, we thank you that we already see the beginnings of the harvest. And I know that it's only going to continue to multiply and increase in intensity. And Lord, I'm just, I'm honored that you chose us to be the ones who are here in this season, in this time, to do your work of the end time harvest. I mean, you chose us. <laughs> and you've anointed us, and you've equipped us. The Lord wants you to know that he chose you. He chose you to be a part of this. 
So submit to the experience of his love. I got to give you an example today of how he's, the experiences that he's given me, but he's going to give you an experience too. And it's going to be just as crazy as keeping two houses or even crazier. And you're going to have to make a choice. Am I going to reason this out and reject the experience or am I going to dive in and ride this thing out? There's more testimonies to come. Amen. You got something back there, Tim? Yeah. He's making a point that, yeah. From the sale of the car, not only did he get to buy his car with cash that he drives now, but he has this, this funding that's available for Darla to start her business, which is going to impact other people. So in the end, it was all about impacting other people. And that's how it is going to be. He's going to take care of your needs, yes. He's going to enhance your life, yes. But the bulk of what we receive here is going to be to impact other people, and it's going to be amazing to watch it happen. Amen. Amen. All right. That's what the Lord had for us today. Y'all be thinking about this throughout the week. Don't just walk out of here and never think about this again because the Lord's got some some corrections to do in your life and you got to walk these out just like I've been walking them out. You got to get rebuked just like I've been getting rebuked. We should all just be open and willing like, Lord, show me what it is. Show me where I'm missing this.